Last week, we started this essential questions. We're thinking about language and literature. And these are the questions that we looked at last week. And do you have any questions? Did you do some thinking? Did you look at them and say, I wonder what we can add to that or anything? Anybody want to add to what is language? Ed, who would like to remind us, language is what? Communication. Communication. Where does it come from? God. From God. God establishes all language. And what is it really for? To glorify God. To glorify God. To speak about God. Did Adam learn a language? What was our answer? Yes. Well, you learned God's language. Did he have to learn it? No. Could he speak right off the bat? Exactly. He spoke a language, and what language did he speak, do we think? English. <laughs> <laughs> Probably Hebrew. That's what we believe it is. It's the language of God. It's just amazing. And what did he use his language for? Naming the animals. That's the first thing. Or is it? Talking to God. Probably talking to God. Yeah. yeah, he had to talk to God. And when God's speaking to him, whether you are speaking or whether you're listening, you're, you're using language. And so he knew all the vocabulary, he knew all the syntax, he knew word order, all of those things, and uh, he used it to fellowship with God. And then God gives him Eve, and then they fellowship together. For how many years does he use language? Adam. How old was he? 930? 930. You are right. And how many languages are there? What did we say? Six, six to seven, seven thousand. Yeah, that's about six to seven thousand. Why are there so many languages? Started at the Tower of Babel. Correct. And then languages mutate, languages change. And so you have all these sub languages and so on and so forth. How many languages can you name? We are not going to take time for that. Besides spoken language, what other kinds of language are there? Yeah, gestures. You got it. <laughs> Body language. Body language. I can tell if you guys are bored or not. Am I going to start doing this? <laughs> Okay, that, those are the languages we have. The, the sign language is wonderful. Uh, there's smoke language, isn't there? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And there's printed language. Yeah. Do languages change? And we said, yes. give me an instance of a word that has changed its meaning. Okay. Yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, ask my mom. It's her middle name. Oh. <laughs> How about in that, any other? Yep. <laughs> we talked about mouse, remember? Yeah. What a mouse used to be and what a mouse is today. The way we talk is very, very interesting. We also and have new words that didn't used to exist and words that go out of use. Yeah. So what are some new words we have today? Um, I think of dinosaur. Wasn't invented until the 1800s. That's right. And the word dinosaur is not in the Bible because there was no such such vocabulary. And it was it came into being. All the new technology that we have. And, you know, you talk about GPS. That's really a word I think today. It's understood. And so languages are constantly changing. I don't know this for a fact, but I understand the. The people from Holland that come to Pella and they listen to Pella people speak Dutch years ago, they said, You're speaking that old Dutch. We don't speak the, you know, you don't have the modern Dutch language. And so if you read the old King James, uh, languages continue to change and they are sort of living languages, we think. 
Here is where we start tonight. How does God's curse affect language? We got some swear words that weren't around before the before the fall. Nikki, I really appreciate that. I'm not speaking from experience. I think you probably begged to differ, but yeah. that's good. I mean, she knows. Leave that <laughs> out. Most of my Thank you. <laughs> Well, some of you have heard about the Tower of Babel, right? All right. How is that a curse? You can't speak with your brother no more. He's speaking a different language. Exactly. We cannot communicate easily. And so, God's curse on languages today, it's so difficult to understand each other. Uh, also, does language affect culture or does culture affect language? Yes. Or is it both? both. It, it works both ways. And so those kinds of things, I see that God's curse on language is basically there are many different languages today, and we cannot communicate easily without studying. So how many of you speak more than one language? Marcel, what do you speak? <laughs> I can, in my language, I in the Philippines, there are so many languages. So, so how many do you speak? Oh, I don't know. I couldn't do that. Visayas, Tagalog, and little English. <laughs> <laughs> Benjamin, how about you? Three. Ga, Akan, and some English. <laughs> <laughs> you, you speak Korean, right? I didn't complete the lessons. But yeah, she did. She, she, knows she speaks some Korean. Korean. Yes, yes. yes. Perfect. How many of you speak Spanish? Danielle, do you speak Spanish? Uh, not fluently. Yeah. You know, because we live in an English speaking country and English is an international language, we really do not have to learn another language. And when you travel outside of the United States, we rely on where we are that they understand our language. It is quite an amazing thing. All right, number 11, what's the relationship between the Tower of Babel and Pentecost? Is there a relationship? Well, Pentecost, they started speaking in different tongues as well, instantly, just like in the Tower of Babel. In order to spread the, in order to spread the gospel, and, and just like the Tower of Babel, in order to spread the people out. Anybody want to add to Nikki's answer? Well, the Tower of Babel would have been more of a curse, and Pentecost would have been a blessing. Thank you. The Tower of Babel divided and Pentecost united. All right. The, the, the Pentecost undoes Babel. Babel confuses. Pentecost, everyone could hear the disciples speaking in their own language. And what that means, did the disciples speak another language or were they hearing? their language being spoken. It's an amazing thing, but that's great answer. Number 12, how does sin affect the way we use language? Ask Nikki. <laughs> she has given her answer. We need some new answers here. You can tear down other people. Yeah. Like when I hear That's my children. That's an tear excellent down. answer. Yeah. All right. We can tear them down. We can destroy <laughs> reputations. We can destroy people. I think so that's the greatest effect. Yeah. Joe, did you say something else? Oh, man. There's a trying to destroy our nation with it. I like your answer, Mr. Nanakoda. Because. 
the, the words that we hear and the words that we read, it's just, it's just so filled with sin and anger and hatred and jealousy and envy. And so languages are greatly affected by sin. What guides you in your use of English? So you speak unguided. The Bible. The Bible. What are some verses in the Bible? I agree with you. What are some verses in the Bible that guide you in your use of English? Say that again, Kelly. I'm constantly quoting the Bible to them when I talk about them having the speech that comes out of their mouth. You know, build each other up and not tear each other down. Yeah. I can't remember. <laughs> Building each other up is very, very important. I think that's one thing that, as I know you folks, guides you in your use of language. English. Mr. Benjamin. Also, the culture of the people. But you want to be careful that you don't, you don't use words that will be offending. Right, so. You carefully choose your words so that Nikki will not be offended. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. You have to know the culture before you uh, begin to speak too freely. Ms. Uh, your heart. Girl, your heart guides. For good or bad. Thank you. Basing on our heart, it usually feel bad, but. <laughs> I, I like your, your insight. I, I think there are verses like whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is true, whatever is pure. Didn't you learn something once upon a time in school? Before you speak, there are three things that has to meet. Is it true? Is it kind? And is it necessary? All right, those three things. Those are very excellent things to keep in mind. And uh, but language is such a blessing. And as you're saying, it's got to encourage, strengthen, inspire, build us up. Number 14. Let's see, we don't have anybody reading it again. I'm reading it all. So, Hinden, we're starting with you. Number 14. Where did the English language come from? And if you read the question, does it mean you have to answer? The Tower of Babel. Who would agree? Yeah. Tower of Babel. Its deep roots go way back there. It's a combination of a whole bunch of languages, right? There's Latin that's used for some of the words, ain't it? How many of you agree with Mr. Nanako? English is a Latin language. Which other languages are Latin? French. And? Spanish. And? Italian. Yes. The romantic language. The English language is made up of all of these languages put together. And so, where does English come from? I, I think, Mr. Nanako, when you have said it very, very well, it is a combination of many, many languages. And that's why English has so many vocabulary words, because we have taken words from different languages and we've incorporated them into our language, and we use them. And so the, the, the challenge is when you're writing, when you're speaking, you don't try to use the same words all the time. You try to show 
I have all of this knowledge of English that I can say it this way or this way or this way. And so English comes from a variety of Latin languages. That's where it comes from. But then there's a deeper answer. It comes from God? Yes. <laughs> What's the purpose of the English language? This is not meant to be difficult. To communicate. To what? Communicate. Yeah, that's right. To communicate, to build up, to train, to encourage, to correct, to rebuke. But that the purpose of language is to be building other people up. Uh, we have this verse to read, and it is chorus turn. Philippians 4 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. Anything is excellent Isn't that a beautiful passage? I just love that. Passage. It's so direct. And you read it and you just feel really encouraged by it. All right, Josie. Read question 16. How do you explain that you are able to speak, read, write, and understand the English? I think that's a good question. Grew up with it. Say that again. Grew up with it. All right. <clears throat> How is it you're able to speak? What do you need to be able to speak English? <laughs> How did you learn it? Hear. Hearing. You were hearing, and then you mimicked it, and that's what you do. And so, you have ears to hear, you've got a tongue, you've been able to force uh, air through your vocal cords until you're able to speak. How are you able to read it? You have to be taught. You were taught. What are the first things you learned about reading? The alphabet. And you had to learn phonics, you had to learn all these sounds for the words. And then, I don't know whether you're old enough, but you remember these, these books, you read cat and mat and sat and fat and hat, and you did all the at words, and then you went to other words. But that's how you learn to read. But you have eyes to see, you have been given understanding. How did you learn to write? You were taught. What's the first thing you were taught in writing? How to hold a pencil properly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then, there you sat, you know, you were doing the alphabet, right? You had to make this whole row of A's, and then you had to circle the best A that you made. Isn't that how it went? But boy, that's a lot of work. Uh, when you learn another language, like Korean, has different characters, you know, practicing those characters is really important because it really teaches you, but that's how you learn to write. You copy and you keep doing it. How is it that you can understand it? What has happened? John. God gave you a mind to interpret and understand. I'd like your answer. God gave you a mind to understand. And so, if you understand English, you know the vocabulary, you know the syntax, you know the word order. All of these things having to do with English, God has given you all of the physical things and the mental things that you are able to speak. I think we speak very quickly, and that's wonderful, but I don't think we always think about what a gift I have that I'm able to speak, I'm able to read and write and understand. Number 17, John. Why learn a foreign language such as Spanish or Chinese? Chinese. <laughs> 
spread the gospel. That would be a very rock solid one. What, what are the schools is, schools here, most schools teach Spanish, what is the rationale? Uh, isn't Spanish like the second most spoken language? I think if you look at the Western Hemisphere, English is the second most spoken language. Spanish, I think, is, is number first, and then I think it's English, and then it goes to Portuguese, Brazil speaks it. Joe? With today's technology, and everybody has this phone, do you think learning another language will um, go out of, out of our lives? Joe asked the question. With the technology, is learning another language going to lose its significance? Is it going to go out of our life? Joe, what do you think? I, uh, well, this is not another language, but I was in Walmart a while back and I spoke to a clerk and she whipped out her phone. It turned out she was deaf. And I spoke into her phone and it printed in English. And that made me start thinking about, you know, the technology is there. Last week I got a message from Korea, written in Korean, and I just took a picture of it on my phone, and then I've got this, uh, it's called Translator, and then you just focus on that Korean, and it, it, it changed it all into English for me. you have any idea how many languages you could do that in? <laughs> I, I don't personally know, but I am assuming that there is going to be as many languages as possible. That's all got to be typed into that. I'm just amazed that it can, it made regular, it made very good sentences to me. I, it wasn't haphazard and think, well, I wonder, you know, what this would have mean. It all made wonderful sense to me. So. I do think, uh, like I took Latin in high school, it makes you appreciate your, your words when you see where they come from. That's right. Like it's a good mental exercise. We were in Latin class together. Both. Was that Belton? Is that Thomas Lang? Yes, I think so. Knowing Latin, you really get a, a great basis for your vocabulary work. Number 18, uh, Burrow. Should there be only one language in the world? Why or why not? If so, which one should it be? <laughs> So are you ready to vote? <laughs> Should there be only one language in the world? Raise your hand if that's correct. Yeah, I didn't want one language, so why should we? <laughs> that well, well, after Babel, God said you're not going to have one language, so... So you're so voting what, against... What, what, yeah, why would we want to go against you God? You make a tremendous, tremendous insight because... According to God's will, the answer is no. And you may read this for us. Joe, is it your turn? Yes. The Lord said, if as one people speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Now let's go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. All right. And so now to when you have a very biblical answer. It would make my life a lot easier if everybody spoke the same language. But because of man's wickedness, mm -hmm. God separates the people. Are there going to be languages in the new heaven and the new earth? We're all going to speak the same language. Thank you. Now, I have some questions. If you are teaching or you are reading novels, you're reading biographies, then there are some questions that I think are very helpful. I think I have biographies spelled wrong, isn't that right? It's a new, new word, I-R. Read number 19, Danielle. Would it be wise for you to have this character for a friend? Why or why not? What do you admire about this character? What are his or her strengths? See, with, with literature, 
you and I can vicariously be in situations by which we can stand back and we can prepare children and even ourselves for situations that we might run into. Reading gives you that tremendous ability. Is this character somebody that is going to be wise for you to make a friend out of this character? Why or why not? We are always measuring that with one another. As we work together, we're always looking at each other. We admire certain things and we look at strengths and say, I need this person in my life. This person really helps me a lot. Well, you can do that through literature. Deb. What concerns do you have about this character? <coughs> what do you see in his, her behavior that could be a negative influence on you? Why? So when you're working with, with students, I don't teach literature anymore, but you can really discern what's in the heart of your students when they are looking at characters and if they can see there are things in this character that are, are not really right, not really what I want to see in my life, it's a very helpful thing. Number 21, Richard. How can you be a blessing to this character? Why do you think so? What would you want to do with him or if he, she came to visit you? Why? Yeah. What music would they want to listen to? What games would they like to play? What kind of food do you think they would like to eat? Those kinds of things. How are you going to be a blessing to this character? I think that's how you and I live our lives as well. How can I be a blessing to this individual, this family? What's going on in these people's lives? <clears throat> Number 22, medical. How could this character be a blessing to you? Why do you think so? How could he or she be a good influence on you? How could he or she be helpful to you? Thank you. Those are just excellent questions where you're going to be able to look into the heart of your own children, your own heart, the heart of other people. We continue to read number 23. Dang. Would your parents be happy that you have this character for your friend? Why or why not? What would your parents like about him or her? What would your parents not like about him or her? I think those are really excellent questions as you are studying a novel, studying a biography. Number 24, Nikki. Could you be true to yourself while spending time with this character? Why or why not? What changes would you need to make in your character for this character to, to like you? Isn't that powerful questioning? Because sometimes we want to be friends of somebody, but we can't be our natural self if we're going to be friends to them. And so this question deals with that kind of thing. And if you've got uh, children, young people, they can wrestle with this vicariously. Ethan, I don't want to skip you. Uh, what advice would you give this character in a particular episode? Here again, you're delving into the heart of the, the students you're teaching. And so there's a certain situation they're in in this story. What advice would you give them? Number 26, so this is a biography of well, these two men, they were the first two men to reach the summit of Mount Everest. Nikki? No, you read. It is Kelly's turn. Why were Edmund Hillary and Tenzin Norgate the first to reach the top of Mount Everest? How would you answer that question? It says God, like God had them be. I love your answer. That's exactly it. So many people had tried before, and these two were the first ones because God allowed that to happen. Tim. <coughs> Helen Keller and Ann Sullivan. That's the name of the book. Why are there blind and deaf people in the world? Does God make people blind and deaf? Explain. Who would like to answer that? Why are there deaf 
Why are there blind people? Helen Keller was blind. She was also deaf. I believe she learned three languages. I think so. I think these are a result of the fall. The fall. It is the result of the fall. And God places these people in our life. Why? To glorify Himself. Thank you. Are we bearing fruit? Are we ministering to them? Are we able to show love and kindness to them? Well, the last question, does God make people blind and deaf? Yes. Yes. He does. And blind and blind. Number 25. What advice would you give this character in a particular episode? Oh, like am I repeating me? Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. You read very well. I will give you another one. Okay. <laughs> the book says Lewis and Clark are lucky to meet says the Sacagawea. How do you explain the fact that they met Sacagawea? So this is out of a secular book. I'm teaching sixth graders. And here they just said about Lewis and Clark are lucky to meet Sacagawea. God had it in the plans. <laughs> Thank you. To save them. When you're reading, make sure whatever they are reading is expressing a biblical view. And you will, you'll see these things come up. Make sure the students understand that, and even ourselves understand it. Number 29. Uh, do you want to read? Okay. Josiah. Why or why not? Because this, the, this whole series was on people working together, Lewis and Clark and Saki Jouer. And so is it good for people to work together? <coughs> Who would say yes? We're made to work together. We work together, we build each other up. Number 30, Marcel. <coughs> Describe a person who would be good for you to do school and work with you. Yeah, now these were kids, these were Korean kids, Korean schools are built so that students work together. Well, there's sin in every life of every nationality, in every Korean, as well as every Amer American. So I wanted the students describe a person who would be good, you know, would be good to do school work with. Are they going to build you up? Are they going to say, you do this, and I'll do that, and what kind of a thing do you have? And so that really finishes up this section, which I want to end with a couple of verses, and this will be Benjamin. Psalm 91, Psalm 19, verse 19. It said, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That is our prayer. That's all with literature. And this one, Jenny. According to the grace given to us, it is a man's gift is pro prophesying. Prophesy. Let him use it in proportion to his faith. Proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. And you have to keep going. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing, contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. That is all guiding our thinking, our speaking, our working together. And Colin, Ecclesiastes 12. You're going to have two slides to read on. Of making many books, there is no end. And much study where, where is? Weary, weary's her body. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear of God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of men. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Oh, wait a minute, Mr. B did not. It should stop the people. That's a mistake. All right. Thank you. You did a very fine job, Colin. 
Thank you so much. All right, we're going to now look at the Christ figure. When we're talking about a Christ figure in literature, we're looking for characters who resemble Christ one way or another. Now, you're not going to find a perfect resemblance of Christ, because if you do, it would have to be Christ himself. But we're going to begin reading here with Hendon. From the beginning of Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all scriptures concerning himself. That's right. They're Christ figures all through the Old Testament. Thank you very much. And so when you determine the Christ figure, what's the first thing you have to do, Cora? Read the entire story before deciding on the Christ figure. All right. Don't get to the end of the first paragraph and say, we have one. You need the whole story. Josie. Christ figures don't need to resemble Christ in every way. If they did, they wouldn't be a Christ figure, but Christ himself. Understand that. Number three. Christ figures are not as pure and holy as Jesus Christ. Keep that in mind as well. Number four, uh, okay. Uh, read this for us, Verla. In looking for Christ figures, consider the following. And what is the first one? The parents. Thank you. The events surrounding his birth, their childhood, their outward appearance. Okay. Now, when you look at their outward appearance, these are just some interesting pictures that I got off of the internet. Isn't that amazing? That's probably the one you're most familiar with. Yep. Is that what Jesus looked like? Have you ever seen a picture of Jesus? You they, never. They didn't have pictures back then. It would have had to been a drawing. That's right. <laughs> and so when you're looking for the Christ figure, what's the last one here for them? Their wisdom and insight. That's right. So these are all things that you want to look at so they say, well, that is maybe the Christ figure. We continue. Uh, Joe. In looking for Christ figures, consider the following. And you may see both. Oh, okay. Their wisdom and insight, their Christ like character, their deep love for others, how they show grace and forgiveness. Empathy. All right, those are all things which Christ showed. What do we see in the literature that we read? All right, we continue. Danielle. In looking for Christ's figures, consider the following. Their wisdom, their obedience, their ability to be a good listener, their faithfulness to speaking truth, their humility. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Those are things to keep in mind. Oh, there's one more. Demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit. All right. Thank you very, very much. Deb. Relationship to other characters in the story. <coughs> Misunderstood, considered crazy or odd. Persecuted, abused, rejected, slandered. Sensitive, compassionate, sympathetic. Associates with the poor, oppressed, hopeless. Okay, and maybe there's one more I don't think forget. Yeah, there it is. Gives hope and light. All right. Just keep those things in mind because we're going to go to work and I'm doing this. Uh, Rich, your turn. Action. Look at their action. Has the power to perform miracles, has the power to heal, has the power to set free, has the power to raise the dead. All right. Thank you. And this one. Uh, the events surrounding their death dies as a martyr for his or her ideals, dies unjustly, returns to life, or is reborn. Being able to identify Christ figures in literature is one way to one way to be literate about literature. All right, here we go. Read this Bible passage, please. Jane. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Who is the Christ? What is the Christ figure? 
The animal that died. The animal that died. Excellent. They are clothed. A lot of people think those were sheep. Maybe they were. We don't know. Okay, here's another one. Read uh, this paragraph, maybe. The story of Noah's flood. Who's the Christ? What's the Christ to be? The ark. The ark. Why do you think so? This is what saved me from God's wrath. You get the nail on the head. The ark is a Christ figure. Alrighty, we're going to read this one. Uh, Ethan. The story of Abraham offering Isaac. The ram. The ram. Yes, I think you agree with him. Anybody want to add? It's the ram. Very good. Read this one. Kelly. Story of Joseph in the Old Testament. There is more than one Christ feast. Judah. Judah is a Christ figure pleading for Joseph. He sinned by his father. I think that's very significant. Keep reading these. Tim? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, sent by his father, rejected by his brothers. And? Next one. Sorry. His own denial. Sorry. Putting two of the Isn't that amazing? All of those are Christ figures. We continue. Read this one, uh, Marcel, or Joe Sight. Read E. Can, can you see this right here? Thank you, Marcel. Correct, Benjamin. Falsely accused. That was Potiphar's wife. Remain silent. Thank you. We keep reading. The story of Joseph in the Old Testament. And read on. Okay. Raised from prison. That's amazing. Filled with God's wisdom. Given all authority. Praise his name. The whole world bows to him. Aren't those beautiful things? We continue. The story of Joseph in the Old Testament. The whole world depends on him for food. Thank you. He left his father's home. Correct. He came into his own, but his own did not receive them. Okay, those are the last two are sort of out of order, but there are things I added to it. We continue. Jeff. Has Mrs. Potiphar's sins placed upon him? Suffers in prison for a man while she goes free. Prepares a place for Israel in Egypt. All right. <laughs> Judah pleading for Benjamin's freedom in life. We mentioned that one earlier, but here it is in the slides. Judah offering to be Benjamin's substitute. Thank you. Ethan. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Who's the Christ speaker? The Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan? How? By helping the woman man. Alrighty. Is there any other? How could the victim be a Christ speaker? Christ was beaten and tortured. That's right. Christ is beaten, left for dead. And that would be also a picture of Christ. Uh, Halle. Spirit of the Prodigal Son. Who is the Christ figure? 
The father. The father. Anybody else? Maybe the son. The robe. How is the robe a symbol of Christ? Because it covers our sins. That's right. We're covered in the righteousness, the fattened calf. And could you make an argument that the prodigal son is a Christ figure? He takes on the sins and he really is basically dead. So he comes back and the father restores him. Alrighty, how many of you are familiar with Narnia tales? And so, the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe, who is the Christ figure? Aslan. Aslan the lion. Alrighty. How many of you ever read Tom Sawyer? Mm -hmm. So if you haven't read it, this is a bad question. Mm -hmm. Who is a Christ speaker? You remember Aunt Polly? She takes in Tom. Tom is an orphan, and she takes in Tom, and she lays her life down for Tom to have life. I look at her as that. Tom is also a Christ figure because he lays down his life for Monk Potter, who is on trial, uh, falsely being accused, and Tom comes to his rescue. Anybody read Helen Keller and Ann Sullivan? You know that story? Who would be a Christ figure? Ann Sullivan. Ann Sullivan. She taught Helen how to read. And herself, and to speak, and taught Helen greater. So Anne laying her life down so Helen could have life. They were friends throughout their whole life, and Anne herself was partially blind. I just really love that story. Any Harry Potter people here? Who is a Christ figure? Harry. Harry. How? Ah. Do I have to give a spoiler for those who haven't seen it? Here's what I say. His coming is foretold. Just like Christ. He spends three days in a coma. I, I think, you know, that's significant. Exhibits constant willingness to engage Voldemort for the salvation of others. Am I stretching anything? Thank you. Here's another one. Christ died for us while we were sinners. And so we call that agape love. It's the deepest love you can have, agape. It's a love full of compassion, full of giving yourself to somebody else. Harry seems only willing and able to sacrifice for his friends, so we call that filio, brotherly love. But that's what I have written. Anybody want to say more than that? Are you familiar with E.T.? Any ETers here? Okay. Well, I think he has no beauty. I agree. <laughs> he's in the world, but he's not of the world. His first English words were be good. <laughs> and he healed people by touching. So that's, that's what I see. I just find that wonderful. And this really ends our study of the literature and really our thinking biblically. Are you ready to study the canons of doors? Sound good to you? Uh, 
Our first lesson is going to go into the history, the environment, the political situation. Uh, I think you're really going to love it. And there are how many points in the canons of Dort? Raise your hand. How many? Show me your fingers. There are five. And I hope to arrange those so that you're going to have to defend your position with these security teams. Thank you for coming, all of you. I really enjoyed teaching you. And next week we're going to be with the uh, Ebenezer Church. And then the, oh, by the way, next week that service starts at 530 and then we're going to have ice cream and we're going to play games afterwards. So come dressed a little casually next week if you want to enjoy that. Are you going to come and video that too, John? No, we'll be in Texas. You're going to be in Texas. So perfect lining up. Thank you. Thank you. Let us close in here. Our Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you that we can look into literature and see how all literature has a Christ figure because you made us in your image and what we write and how we think is always framed by that reality. May you bless us in this week. May we be your blessing. Thank you for this wonderful dinner tonight and for those families who have made it for us. May you bless them as well. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.